Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. Just let everyone continue to log on. All right, let's go ahead and begin. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. This is the first of our Witham and Genova Burns joint webinar series for the cannabis sector, planting the seed and how to overcome the financial, legal, and other weeds to become a winner. Today's program will serve as an introduction to the financial and legal hurdles of the cannabis industry. Our presenters are Raj Perrick and Jennifer Roselle of Genova Burns and Tom Reck and Ryan Brandt of Witham. Before we begin, I have a few notes. Today's materials can be found on the toolbar on the right of your screen. Also, at the bottom of the toolbar, you will see a chat box. Feel free to send us your questions during the presentation. We will do our best to address them at the end. Once the webinar is over, there will be a pop-up asking you to complete a survey of today's webinar. Please take a moment to complete it. It is our way of being able to provide you with the best and most relevant programs possible. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Raj. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and thank you all for joining us here today. Um, I know we're all living in this weird COVID world and people are spending all day on the Zooms and, and go to meetings. So I know that all of us at Chernobyl Burns and with them appreciate you taking your time out of your day um, to join us here for what we think is a really exciting topic. I um, also want to thank Tom and Ryan and the Witham team um, for partnering up with our firm, uh, myself and Jen and our colleagues at Chernobyl Burns um, on cannabis. And the way we've kind of broken down today is um, we're going to start by first doing a poll. Uh, because what we really want to do is be able to tailor what we talk about at a high level um, into you know what it is that's useful for all of you that have joined us today so rachel if you can first put the poll on that would be great we can start with that so if you can just we're going to let the poll stay up there for another 15 to 20 seconds we'll then take it down and go from there Right, about 10 more seconds. All right. Perfect. Let's close it so, out. Here are the results. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we've got about a third of our folks looking to get involved, uh, a little bit under half. Um, as service providers, investors, um, business owners, and then other, which is great. So I think what we'll be able to do today is provide you all with information that should be helpful to all of you. Um, this is, you know, as I'm sure you read in, in some of the intro materials that were sent out, this is meant to be kind of the intro of a series of panels that uh, Witham and Genova Burns are going to do together. Um, some of the future series that we planned not only do we want input and feedback from all of you as to what you'd like to hear about, what you'd like to see, but we also plan on getting a little bit more into specifics on, on um, issues that impact particular parts of this industry. 
Um, but for, for now, what I think we're going to do today is I'll start by just talking a little bit about the lay of the land, um, all of the exciting things that have happened just within the last few days here within New Jersey um, that I know everybody has been anticipating for many, many years. Um, I'll then turn it over to my colleague, Jen Roselli, who's going to go through some of the legal background and just some background issues for those of you that don't know much about the industry um, or are new to the industry. And then we're going to turn it over to Tom and Ryan um, to talk a little bit uh, more about some particulars on, on uh, financing and, road, and uh, hurdles to look out for. Um, and then finally, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, the last thing I'll say as an intro is, uh, or last two things actually, is I know there were some questions that came in um, early uh, and before the presentation started. So we'll make sure that we try to cover those questions throughout the presentation today. Um, and if we, if you have more questions, there's a, a way for you to submit questions to us directly. Feel free to do it as the um, as our seminar is going on, and we'll go from there. And then finally, I really wanted to thank Rachel and, and uh, Tammy, Rachel from Witham and Tammy from Chenoa Burns, who I know have worked really hard to put this entire program together. So appreciate both of them and the hard work that they did. Um, so why don't we get started? Uh, you know, New Jersey, uh, as you all know, many states have decriminalized or made ad adult recreational marijuana usage um, legal, uh, even though it's been uh, still uh, Schedule III narcotic under the federal laws and remains illegal under federal law. Um, states have created a unique legal concept to allow for and create cannabis-based marketplaces um, within their states. And Governor Murphy, when running for office uh, four, four and a half years ago, made uh, legalization and decriminalization of cannabis um, and cannabis products one of the pillars of his campaign. And since he was elected in 2017, I think his team is really focused on trying to figure out a way to create a long lasting, robust marketplace um, within New Jersey for cannabis. What other states have experienced is that they would see a, what everyone calls the green rush, right? The ability to sell shovels for the, for the immediate green rush, but then a consolidation of the marketplace um, and essentially a lack of competition, which drove prices higher and reduced supply. And so it became a problem um, in some of those states to create a long lasting kind of robust ecosystem and marketplace for the benefit of consumers and, and business owners. And New Jersey, I think, has, has laid out a plan that will hopefully avoid those pitfalls, having learned what other states have done. Um, and so what New Jersey started many years ago, for those of you that that are involved in the business is a medical marijuana program. If you're a resident of New Jersey and you had certain medical conditions, you could go to a doctor. Um, that doctor could prescribe a medical cannabis for your use to alleviate uh, or alleviate whatever conditions you had. And so the first step during the Murphy years was to uh, expand the ailments that the medical cannabis program could cover. And it was highly successful, um, led to a significant increase in the number of medical uh, cannabis license applications throughout the state. Um, it also led to uh, a second and third round of medical cannabis licensing applications with the New Jersey Department of Health. Um, and that really is kind of the framework and the groundwork that is important to understanding where the adult use marketplace is going to go in the state and how the regulatory system is going to work. Um, and those are some of the things that Jen is gonna talk about in a little bit more detail um, as we move along with the presentation today. Um, so with the medical cannabis program, you had an initial uh, handful of dispensaries located geographically throughout the state, um, Secaucus, Montclair, um, Little Egg Harbor Township in the South. Um, and that was the first group, all of which are open and running now. And then you had a second group, um, uh, which applications were put in. There were hundreds of applications uh, with just a handful of what we call vertically integrated licenses. So people who, um, and companies who are able to not just grow and process um, their product, but also then to, to sell it in a retail medical environment. Um, there's a lot of regulations related to that, and those companies in seeking a medical uh, license or medical dispensary license, medical processing license, also were required to have research programs and other things to support the medical work um, that they were doing. And so that has had led to this framework and legislation that uh, that the legislature tried to pass many times and unfortunately failed for a variety of reasons on an adult use cannabis marketplace in New Jersey and regulatory structure. Um, eventually, uh, the legislature was unable to really get the law done 
And so what they did was they, the proponents of the legislature put it to a public question. And this past November, November 2020, there was a question um, on the ballot about whether or not adult use cannabis in New Jersey should be uh, part of our state and should be permitted. And the voters overwhelmingly decided that it should. And so what you had since November until Monday was you had a series of, of pieces of legislation that create this entire framework for cannabis in New Jersey, adult use cannabis, meaning that you don't have to have a medical condition anymore. You, If you'd like to buy, uh, whether it's um, actual flour um, to smoke or bake or do whatever you want, or you want to buy uh, THC products, meaning you know whether it's gummies or other things that if you're involved in the industry know exist in many other states, um, that you have the ability to do so as a consumer. And with that, is the creation of a regulatory structure and framework um, to be able to regulate that within the state to make sure that uh, people who are using cannabis, that it's only the people that are supposed to be, meaning folks that are 21 and older, um, just like alcohol, and that it's regulated. And most importantly, at least from the state's perspective, I'm sure, is the ability for it to be taxed and for that money to go back into the communities um, around the state. Uh, there were a series of issues. There was legislation that was passed um, and then there were some road bumps um, and hiccups in it, primarily not on the business end of things, which is where we're going to focus today um, or focus most of our time today, but more on some of the social justice and some of the technical legal issues. Um, one of those hiccups, for example, was that it remained um, uh, possible for someone under the age of 18 to buy black market cannabis products and then not be uh, criminally responsible for that or not have any type of regular regulatory framework, whereas for somebody who was over over the age of 21 who purchased black market cannabis or someone who sold uh, black market, so your traditional quote unquote drug dealer, um, could have a criminal penalty. And so there were some inequities and some things that were internally inconsistent in the legislation. Um, and there was a lot of effort put into uh, cleanup bills, which finally were passed um, on Monday and which the governor signed into law. So as we sit here today, um, and it's very timely, um, adult cannabis is legal in New Jersey. The Attorney General of New Jersey um, earlier this week uh, put out a directive to stop arrests and prosecutions um, for, for those who are in possession of cannabis, which would be legal under the existing uh, legal framework passed by the legislature and now the law of the land. Um, and really where we're heading is now the creation of this overarching regulatory framework where business owners, investors, uh, service providers will be will have to go through a process to apply for a license um, to have to have a facility that either produces adult use cannabis, uh, processes or manufactures it um, from a raw plant material, or sells it um, to the consuming public. Um, and collects both revenue for themselves and, and tax implications. Now, layered on top of that, which I know Tom and Ryan are going to talk about, is still this notion that this is illegal under federal law. And so if you buy uh, uh, marijuana in New Jersey that is legal and you drive to Pennsylvania or you drive to New York, because you've gone from one state to the other, you have violated a federal law. And that also goes for those who are growing products um, and transporting them and those who are manufacturing products or whatever part of the business that you're in. And with that, uh, one of the primary impacts is because we deal with a federal banking system and uh, federal, you know, essentially insurance companies that operate across state lines. And so there are really practical impacts here of a uh, regulated cannabis marketplace within a state that New Jersey investors and business owners and all of you um, that are interested in getting involved in this have to face. And that really is where our teams at Genova Burns and Witham come into play. Um, and the kind of guidance and assistance that we can provide um, for strategic judgment, business intelligence, um, and really understanding how this marketplace is gonna roll out um, and, and when it's gonna roll out and what, what strategies can be used, not only to make sure that um, those involved are not uh, exposed to any types of liability to pro be prosecuted or, or uh, legal liability in terms of civil liability, but also aren't getting in trouble with the IRS tax, uh, the New Jersey taxation authorities, and aren't putting other businesses that, that you may own um, at risk because of getting involved in this, this new industry and new marketplace. 
Um, so what I think the best thing to do is that's kind of the overarching lay of the land. Um, you have, there are people now who have been appointed to the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission, which is the new agency that has been created to uh, not only create the application process and to score applications and put those out, um, but also to regulate and create regulations related to this entire system. The one other thing I will say is what happened last week um, that is very interesting is that the New Jersey Appellate Court uh, issued a decision regarding a challenge to uh, the last round of applications for New Jersey for the New Jersey medical licenses. The reason that's important is because the New Jersey medical license applications that went in, I think in August of 2019, it must be, um, you know, were held up because of this whole court battle as to whether certain disqualifications were appropriate or not appropriate. And what the court essentially decided is that some are allowed in and some are allowed out, but that the process should move forward. That's important because those who hold medical licenses have the ability um, right off the bat under the law to be able to sell recreational uh, cannabis products to the marketplace. So, so for practical purposes, those folks are gonna be the first in the marketplace. But I think that based upon the, the reports that have come out from the New Jersey Department of Health, there really is a significant demand here. Um, and I think there are really great business opportunities um, for everyone involved, as long as they make sure to be careful about the hurdles that exist. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Jed, um, who's going to talk a little bit more about just the lay of the land in terms of the, the federal um, marketplace, uh, and the federal laws related to this, the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission, and then a really important component of not only the, the legal underpinnings of the law in New Jersey, which is social justice, but also how that social justice component gets integrated into business opportunities that exist for those interested in joining the marketplace. So Jen, happy to kick it off to you. Um, and we'll happy to hear any questions that anybody has later on. Thanks, Raj. Um, can I ask, for, there we go, the next slide. So thank you for those of you who are joining us on your lunch break. Thanks for taking some time to talk to us. Um, like Raj said, I'm gonna talk about the high points of these bills. I mean, it was a 241 page, give or take, however you looked at it. Um, enabling legislation plus some companion bills. So we're, we're going to talk about the very kind of 30,000 foot view with a focus on what it does, the social justice implications of these laws. But first, before I get there, my license wouldn't let me uphold if I didn't warn you that under federal law, cannabis does still remain illegal. Um, there are some exemptions for hemp, and we've seen some movement on the federal side. Um, we saw the House pass the Moore Act back in December. It didn't really go anywhere. We've seen kind of some discussion recently about bringing back the decriminalization discussions. Um, but on the federal side, for the immediate moment, we are still looking at something that is prohibited. Next slide, please. Okay, so that federal status, what really does have a lot of impact on this market, and it's going to impact how we do business here in New Jersey, because you don't have things like access to banks, um, you risk visa revocation, you risk the FDA knocking on your door and saying, hey, wait a second, you're not doing this right. You don't have the ability to register and prosecute certain trademark claims, and there's some, some SEC violation issues that you have troubles with too. Next slide, please. Okay, as Raj said before, New Jersey overwhelmingly supported the constitutional amendment um, to allow for cannabis to come off of the controlled substance list. Um, we saw, I think it was 67% of the state said, let's do this. The confusion that this caused and where this enabling legislation became so incredibly important was just because we constitutionally amended the, the scheduling we still didn't have a right to go out and puff, puff, pass our way through. We had to wait for that enabling legislation to come through. Next slide, please. And that's what we just saw happen during this week. So we have this new law. It is the enabling law that gives force to the amendment that we all voted for, whether it was pro or for. Um, it creates that Cannabis Regulatory Commission that Raj has mentioned. It talks about how we're going to see licensing occur. The illicit market cannabis remains illicit. For me to be technically protected, I need to be purchasing from a legally recognized regulated business, um, which right now there are none. Uh, Raj mentioned it, but we expect to see it be that medical dispensary conversion as the first access point. We see this new concept, which kind of gets embedded in the 
social justice of micro businesses, which gives smaller businesses an opportunity to compete instead of those MSOs. Um, we see this huge impact on taxes because it is subject to sales tax. Municipalities have a right to tax within if it's being done. Um, and the municipalities are like, ooh, this could fill our budget holes. Um, so it has a lot of appetite out there. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the basic rule is that for certain amounts of cannabis product, it will decriminalize possession and use. Again, it is limited to adults 21 and over who are given this protection. Again, you have to purchase this directly from somebody who holds that license, wherever that ends up being. You still don't have the right to smoke and vape in public. You still don't have the right to use and drive. Um, but what it does create is a right for employees, and for those of you who want to have businesses, requirements for your employees and the protection for either the use of cannabis product or the decision not to use cannabis product. I am protected no matter which side of the equation I fall on. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, you heard me say it, you cannot drive under the influence. One of the really big things here that's worth noting is that odor by itself is no longer considered probable cause of criminal activity. So, you, you know, we all kind of know that the, the stereotypical cop pulls you over and says, oh, your car smells like marijuana, I'm going to search it from soup to, uh, soup to nuts. Um, that is no longer by itself sufficient to justify that. And that is a huge shift in how policing is going to happen here in the state, where it should be. Um, and we know that that is going to be something that the AG's office is putting out more and more guidance. We saw the preliminary guidance come out either yesterday or the day before um, with a kind of Q&A on what does this mean for law enforcement? But that is a huge, huge challenge and a huge change to what has been happening, um, particularly because that in, in practicality becomes the entry into a search that probably isn't legal anymore. Um, again, we're gonna see this development of a cannabis marketplace, we're going to see all these taxes. And then the underlying pin of this is the social justice goals that we're going to talk about a little bit later. We see this law really set forth a structure and an intent to ensure that communities who have been disproportionately affected are going to see the money flow back into those communities. Um, and we'll talk about that in some detail later. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to kind of give you the, the high point, the CRC, our Cannabis Regulatory Commission, is going to be five people. They're going to do the development, the regulation, and the enforcement. There's going to be a chair, a vice chair, and three members. We have three of the five publicly named as, as of today. Um, those regulations are going to be huge. Right now, there are pieces of the law that are technically in effect, but not considered operational. For example, all those employment things that are out there, they are not actually operational unless and until the CRC puts out those regs. So we are anxiously waiting to see where they fill in gaps, if there are gaps to be filled. We're anxiously waiting to see how they're going to regulate the industry from both the sales, purchase, the sales, the purchases, and then the effects on the everyday kind of day-to-day -day implementation of this. Next slide, please. All right, and again, you heard me mention it earlier. There is going to be a sales tax that can be uh, attached to some of this. Municipalities may impose the additional 2% um, for tax. It will be uh, used for their budgets. We have seen some towns kind of informally thinking this is great. And by the way, if you were one of those towns who voted against cannabis in prior to this law, you're going to have to go through um, that kind of process. Again, those become eliminated. And then on top of that, we have what can be a social equity excise fee. Um, it is something that is potentially assessed on cultivators. It will be a third of a percent. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means later today. Um, but it is money that is designed and earmarked to go back into the communities. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about some of those social justice considerations, because if we think about this, the law spelled out right on its face what the legislature was trying to accomplish. There's no surprises here. The law was supposed to focus or let law enforcement focus on what they called serious criminal activities and public safety. Somebody mentioned it earlier. I think it was in one of the questions. You know, this was designed 
to undermine the illicit marketplace. And there is a particular commitment here to preventing youth access. Um, and there was an intent and a goal to strengthen drug abuse education, particularly for our, our state's youth, um, to enhance our drug addiction treatment processes. Next slide, please. And this whole focus on, on shifting away for things that would just completely and totally debilitate your future, right? You get caught with a joint, it can ruin your entire life. And we are trying to move away from that. And one of the very surprising facts that we've come across was that Jersey was number 11 in 2018 for the number of black persons arrested for possession as compared to others who were using the same kind of amount. Um, and then on top of that, we see from the legislature, we're not looking to sacrifice our public safety and rights by having these wasteful enforcement policies. And that sounds really nice until you look. And we spent $127 million on this marijuana possession enforcement. Um, so that is, I mean, a huge shift in policy, a huge shift in the way we've done business um, with a focus on improving and taking away the impact on somebody's jobs, their housing, their family, their, all of those things that you don't really think about when you're talking about, well, it was just a joint. Next slide, please. Okay, so what now will happen is by operation of law, you will see criminal expungements of certain cannabis related offenses. We are going to see vacating sentences that are still remaining. Some of that court ordered supervision, some of that court ordered financial assessments, those are going to disappear as well. And the way the statute is worded, the AG's office is directed to take steps to do this as quickly as possible. So New York did something similar uh, a couple of years ago where they were obligated in the courts to put out PSAs and try and get this moving. We may or may not see this mirrored here, um, but just keep in mind that this AG's office has been incredibly proactive in the approach to this legalization. You know, we saw that early on the AG's office went out and said, hey, prosecutors, you've got discretion. Remember that we saw the AG's office go out there and say, OK, prosecutors, put a put a pause on some of these criminal convictions. Um, and then we've also, I alluded to it earlier, we're going to, we've already seen guidance from our AG's office about law enforcement, what it means under those new laws. There's a nice little cheat sheet about what is no longer criminal. Um, and they actually even talk about things for in-school possession for those under the age of 21 and how schools now have to react to this too because of the, the penalty tiering or the, the reprimand tiering that has come in. So we're already seeing our law enforcement, our chief law enforcement agent, really kind of take this and make sure that everybody understands that these rights exist and promulgate rules, guidelines, whatever it may be, to get us across that finish line. Next slide. Okay. Um, again, we are looking at the social justice considerations to give promoting pr uh, participation from those who have been in socially and economically disadvantaged communities. They're checking the effectiveness of this, this office. It exists today, but they changed the name. You know, they're looking for 30% of some of the licenses to be businesses as certified minority women or uh, veteran businesses. It's a 15, 15% split. You can see it on the slide there. And that office is meant to go out there and actively promote Remote, right? So they're supposed to do ads, they're supposed to do seminars, they're supposed to be informational programming. Their website information is supposed to give you information about business management, business matters, and marketing. So there's this true emphasis on taking individuals who have not always been in a position to just jump into a marketplace and really give them that opportunity to compete. Next, please. Okay, and then we also have this fund that is now being set aside for the social justice considerations. It's any of the fees and civil penalties that that CRC is going to co uh, collect over time. You're going to see maybe some of the social ex equity excise fee put into there as well if it gets impacted. Um, and then 70% of tax revenue for those retail sales gets appropriated to investments. That's grants, that's loans, that's other financial assistance to what they now define as impact zones. Next slide, please. And those impact zones are the municipalities who have had, you can kind of see it there, who have had higher unemployment, poverty, some combination thereof because of past criminal enterprises. Um, population has to be 120 or above. You've got to have 40% in the state for marijuana or hash arrest. 
um, you have to exceed the crime indexes, local average unemployment has to be within the 15%. So they're really focusing on uncertain statistical information, which gives the funding um, to that area, and we'll talk about what it's going to be used for, but it also allows the commission to make recommendations for some direct financial assistance as well. Um, and certainly leaves room that if, if possible and if available, there can be more money allocated from the fund to those impact zones. Next slide, please. Okay, and sorry, I just popped out the question window. If the social equity tax um, fee that we were talking about earlier is going to be on potentially on those class one cultivator licenses, it will be one third of 1% of the statewide average retail cost per ounce. Um, and then later on in the future, there becomes a sliding scale adjustment based on the price or if it's up to X amount of dollars, how much can be on there. Um, that adjustment will be through the CRC. It will not be for your alternative treatments. And again, it is the same thing for investment. You want grants, loans, reimbursement of expenses, direct financial individuals to, and here it is, create, expand, and promote opportunities, health and well-being of communities and individuals. So we, we see embedded in this law from go, the end goal here is to funnel that money back into communities and help with programs that go towards that social justice reform. Next slide, please. And these are the types of things that we're gonna see. There is a requirement for all of this money to go through a public hearing. I believe it was in all three areas, North, Central, and South. There really is a Central Jersey, I swear. Um, so we're going to see things like educational support to improve literacy, GED programs, tutoring, social services, getting people food access, getting mental health services, um, substance abuse treatment and recovery, which is you know, incredibly important. And then on top of that, again, that focus back on the youth, which is youth mentoring and legal aid. Next slide, please. And this is where some of the other areas that, that fee can go to, some startup grants, some lower interest loans, some job training. Um, and each year we're gonna see the legislature giving a list of investments. And really importantly, how do these support and advance social equity? Now we have seen other states try and do the initiatives. We've seen it in Massachusetts. We've seen kind of some rocky terrain there. So hopefully these guidelines get us moving in that direction. Um, without having some of those bumps along the way, because this is very well detailed um, and really does require our state to hold itself accountable for those changes. Next slide. And with that, I am gonna turn it over. Um, I think it's Ryan, you're up next, but thank you all for, for joining us. Thanks, Jennifer. Tom, you wanna get us started? Sure, sure. Just as as a backdrop, just to um, feed off of of what was just discussed, you know, currently there's 13 medical marijuana dispensaries throughout the throughout the state, and there's about a hundred thousand dollars registered registered patients. And when you now look at um, the passage of the legislation that will open up the recreational market, um, it has the effect of uh, increasing the tax revenue into the state significantly. Uh, there have been some estimates that put that at about a $450 million range in terms of new tax monies. And then on top of that, as was previously discussed, was the 2% tax that could be imposed by different municipalities. When you look at the state of New Jersey, it has about 8.9 million residents. And the estimated market that cannabis market that is expected to go with that population range is somewhere in the tune of $1.5 billion by the end of 2023. So as a result of the passage of the legislation, obviously now um, the, the application process um, will start once everything is finalized. Uh, and it'll be up to everybody to carefully fill out all of the applications. And in order to do that, uh, there's going to be a number of considerations that must be made by anyone looking to get into this to this area of business. Um, there's safety and security plans that that will need to be addressed, um, given that uh, this is largely a cash business. You know, there's always the risk of someone being robbed, so you have to be 
you have to have security in place to protect the, the assets and the individuals that work uh, for you. There needs to be cybersecurity plans in place to protect any personal information that might be, uh, might be maintained by the entity. There needs to be the ability to show financial competence. You know, who are the funding sources that you're going to be uh, getting your funding from? And there has to be obviously some sort of uh, prevention or diversion prevention policies in place so that you don't have uh, assets walking out the door. So, you know, just by way of backdrop, um, you know, this legislation, this, the, Governor Murphy signing this law now uh, really does open up um, quite an upside, not only for the state, but also for others looking to get into the industry itself. So with that, I'm going to throw, throw that over to Ryan. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, Raj. Jennifer, you guys did a great job kind of navigating that bill. A lot of good information there. Um, uh, we had this slide up for a little while, micro businesses. Um, this is just one of the cooler uh, aspects of the bill, right? This is something that um, I think is pretty neat. So New Jersey actually carved out a section in the bill for micro businesses. Uh, what are micro businesses? Basically what I have here, it's less than 10, 10 employees. You can't have uh, more than a thousand plants on hand every month. Uh, you can't occupy more than 2,500 square feet, uh, and you can't have more than 1,000 pounds of cannabis uh, if you're processing it. Um, so I thought that was pretty neat, and I believe that some states have already demonstrated that there's a strong market existence for these boutique cannabis companies. You know, similar to the craft beer and microbrew phenomenon, uh, a lot of the larger operations are focused on um, mastering this, the strains and mastering the plant of, of, of one single strain in the life cycle of that plant. So they put all of their blood, sweat, and tears into that one product, which is probably a great product, but it, but it leaves a ton, a ton of open space for experimentation uh, that's been untapped and gives opportunity to the smaller enthusiasts. Uh, so that's what these micro businesses are. And the bill has carved out a space for them and it makes it a reality here in the state. So I think it's awesome that you know smaller businesses are allowing for a new flavor in the industry. And it's not just, this bill just doesn't just focus on the on the big guys taking over the market. So really excited about that. Uh, Rachel, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so there's six separate classes of licenses uh, uh, with this introduction of the bill. Uh, I'm not gonna go through each one, how many uh, licenses are uh, gonna be uh, distributed out there, but we have six different classes. You have the cultivator license, that's if you're growing, right? You have the processing license, uh, the wholesaler license, distribution license. If you want to open a dispensary, you're going to need a retailer license. If you're going to be, if you're going to want to transport uh, cannabis, right? You have a transporting company, you're going to need a license for that. Um, so there's very, there's a lot of subdivisions in this industry to get involved in. And going through the licensing process can be somewhat daunting uh, when legally starting your business, right? So I say legally starting your business because there's no question that the illicit market or the, uh, the black market dominates in all of the states that have adult use. And I just wanna quickly mention uh, the unique part of this bill, which is completely different from every other state. And I believe Jennifer may have mentioned it or, or Raj. Um, if you can possess, purchase, and smoke cannabis in New Jersey, you still risk uh, charges, criminal charges for growing it, right? So you don't have homegrown here in New Jersey. Um, so this is so this. I think I, I, I saw in the chat somebody had mentioned this. This is a huge win for those who are going through the licensing process, who want to start a business legally. And they want to do what it takes to become that entrepreneur and participate in this industry. So in my opinion, you know, disallowing individuals to grow from home, it may contribute to a decline in the illicit market sales, um, and it might bring individuals back into the dispensaries. Um, that's just a thought, but um, I thought that was a pretty unique part of the bill. Uh, next slide, please, Rachel. Hey, I'll pick up, Ryan. Uh, one of the considerations that you, that that needs to needs to be given some thought is this whole issue of insurance. Um, as we discussed, this is a heavily cash business, so there needs to be insurance in, in place to make sure that, um, you know, the directors and officers are, are properly insured, um, that there's, uh, you know, insurance in place and God forbid something happens to someone. But there's also some other things that need to be given consideration too, and that gets into the crop itself. So if you're a grower, 
you know, what happens if you've invested a whole bunch of money into the crops themselves and then there's an issue with the crop and you lose it. So you have to give consideration to insurance from, from that perspective. You also have to give consideration to the extent that there are consumables such as gummies, things of that nature, that um, if something should happen to somebody after using one of them or taking one of them, that uh, there's insurance in place to uh, cover, again, cover the company so that everything is, is not lost. So this is an area that uh, if you're going to get into this, per, this line of business, you have to be very careful to make sure that uh, you are properly insured. Next slide, please. One of the uh, one of the issues that's being faced, obviously, is the lack of funding uh, from banks. The banking system is regulated by federal law, so they cannot fund uh, the marijuana industry or cannabis industry at this point in time. Um, in addition to that. Um, Banking institutions are also covered by AML or anti-money laundering uh, procedures that need to be in place. And many of them feel that for the amount of potential um, you know, individual companies that are going to be involved versus the overall marketplace, it doesn't make sense for them to expend the money to do all of the necessary steps, take all of the necessary steps to put the anti-money laundering procedures in place. I can tell you that um, Witham has worked directly uh, with a bank very recently uh, to help them institute the procedures necessary uh, so that they would be in compliance with AML. And I was on the phone, as a matter of fact, with someone from a bank just the other day who is has made the decision or is going to be making the decision, I should say, so don't ask me who it is. They, they will be making the decision to move ahead and uh, take on cannabis clients. But the, again, this is something that needs to be um, carefully thought about. So if you're looking for funding, it's not going to be coming from banks. So there's going to have to be some other um, methods to, to raise that money in place. You'll also see that um, there, there's credit card companies do not accept. They do not work directly with cannabis companies. There are no codes, merchant codes. Um, for the for the industry relating to cannabis. So if they were to somehow be selling goods that, you know, they would have it listed as something else, whether it's a bakery or whatever it might be. So those are some of the things that need to be uh, given consideration in the in, in starting a business and just the overall realization that uh, there's going to be more cash associated with this industry as opposed to so many others. Next slide and right. Yeah, so, so with that, uh, speaking of hurdles, Tom, I mean, I'm just going to get into the, the, the tax implications. And, you know, this is my specialty, Section 280E. And it's so important if you're going to be getting involved in the cannabis industry. Uh, I think you need to just know the basics of what this entails and how it could affect your business. So real quick, I know we have only a couple minutes left, but um, IRC Section 280E, it's just a very short tax provision in the tax code that says if you're dealing with a Schedule One or Schedule II list of substances, according to the Controlled Substance Act, you're considered trafficking, right? And if you're considered trafficking, you're unable to take certain ordinary business deductions on your tax return. Uh, however, this do does not preclude you from deducting the cost of the product that you're selling. So, so generally, generally speaking, right, if it's not related to the cost of goods sold, you cannot deduct it. It's lost in space, it's a permanent difference, gone, okay? This is a huge issue for taxes. Okay, so let's put that in perspective real quick. If you operate, let's say, a marijuana dispensary, Section 280E is going to be a big problem, all right? I'm not trying to scare you. It's just the reality of it, right? You can only deduct the price of the product and the transportation of that product, period. You're unable to take a, de a deduction for your payroll costs, right? Big, big expense there. You're, you're unable to take a deduction for electricity advertising, rent, office supplies, even your expensive security that you're required to put into place to protect your, your, your dispensary, those are all lost, right? Those are all ordinary expenses in the normal, normal course of business that you no longer get, okay? So there is somewhat of a silver lining in all of this. Uh, there's a lot of different subdivisions in the industry, as I mentioned before, with all the licenses. 
you know, you have the growing manufacturing distribution, et cetera. I will say if you are a cultivator, you're growing the product, you know, you're still operating within the bounds of Section 280E, but you're in a way better position than the, than the dispensary. All right. So expenses that are going into making the product, uh, building that product, growing that product. Think about what goes into growing that product. Most of the cultivation expenses go into growing that product. So that falls under cost of goods sold. Uh, certain things like labor for the farmers, right? Those are deductions. Water, soil, testing, warehousing. Even the uh, grow equipment, right? You have grow lights. If you have an indoor facility, you have fans, refrigeration. These are all deductible expenses, which is great, right? So, so as a cultivator, you know, 280E still applies, but you're not going to be on the scale of the, uh, the storefront dispensary, right? And I'm going to show you an example now. If we go to the next slide, um, how this could affect a dispensary. Um, uh, you could keep going. So the cost of goods sold for dispensary, yeah, cultivators, all these are all these are good costs of goods sold, grow equipment. Uh, keep going. And here's here's our example, right? We're looking at an example now. Um, we have two businesses, Bob's Bakery and Mary Jane's Edibles. They're both selling brownies, right? However, obviously Mary Jane's Edibles have that one other ingredient in it, which is THC. Okay, that's the only difference between these two companies, right? They both have gross income of a million dollars. Their gross margin percentage is real nice at 67%. However, when we go down to our taxable income, for whatever reason, we look at Mary Jane's edibles and we're at a million dollars of taxable income. Bob's Bakery's at $725,000 of taxable income. Um, that's a $275,000 difference. And that's because that one ingredient does not allow us to take ordinary and necessary business expenses such as advertising, payroll, rent, and office supplies. So when we do our tax return, we're going to come up with uh, a, a tax bill of $210,000 for, for Mary Jane and only $150,000 for Bob, right? So that's, a, that's almost a $60,000 difference because of that one ingredient. And that's what 280E does to um, cannabis companies. And it's, it, it's real and it's very important to understand. It's very important to get a team on board to navigate that law. Thanks, guys. Next slide. Hey, I'll take this one, Ryan. So tax structuring, uh, if you're looking to form an entity, you need to give consideration to the various choices that available to you. One, you know, the simplest of all, obviously, is sole proprietorship. But again, getting back to the conversation that we had earlier regarding uh, the illegality still at the federal level, uh, the 280E costs, the whole issue of um, any sort of potential liability that might go with the sale of the product, you, you know, you need to be careful if you're going to be, you could do this as a sole proprietor. Um, there, you're then offered some other op opportunities, right? You could form a partnership. Um, partnerships are great if, you know, you're the person running the business and you want to be the general partner but you need funding from other individuals to help you get the business off the ground. They could be limited partners. So you could, you know, they would share in a percentage of the overall profitability, but you as running the business would be able to um, benefit from, from your role as, as the person leading the charge, so to speak. Then you have S corporations. I mean, obviously uh, a benefit to the S corporation is your afforded protection. The corporation's considered a separate entity, and I should probably also throw in their LLCs. Uh, so the only difference there, or, or a difference that one would need to consider then between an S corporation and an LLC would be an S corporation, if Ryan and I were, part, were partners, let's say, and we were 50% partners, Ryan and I would have to share in any distributions equally. If it was an LLC, Ryan and I could each be 50% owners but we could agree that the profits would be distributed differently in some other fashion other than ownership. Um, you'd also have to realize too that with S corporations, you need to give consideration to the concept of reasonable compensation so that you're taking compensation commensurate with the work that you're actually performing at the entity. So that needs to be a consideration as well. And then last on the list here is C corporations. Uh, C corporations obviously uh, you have the the issue there of double taxation. So the entity gets taxed and then any distributions paid from it to the individual shareholders 
are taxed again at, a, at, at the individual level upon pass through of the, of the profits from the entity to the individual owner. So that's something that needs to be in consideration too. So, you know, the long, the, the, the short of it is uh, if you are looking to um, develop a business in this area, there are different alternatives available to you, but you need to be uh, careful in which one you choose and speak with your accountant to, to choose the best one given your, given your circumstances. Ryan, over to you. Yeah, and just one last point before we get to questions. Uh, uh, we have management companies on this slide. So I just wanted to say, you gotta be careful when setting up management companies. I've been seeing a lot of a lot of businesses, you know, setting up almost a shell company or holding company, funnel all of those 280E expenses I talked about before up into that shell company and saying, all right, it's a management company. You know, we're not plant touching, but you gotta be careful, right? Because, you know, the IRS is out there, they're coming, they're looking for this kind of stuff. And they're going to say, is that really a management company or are you just using it to funnel your SG&A expenses for tax purposes? So even though that company might not be a plant touching company, it might be guilty by associate, association and it can be subject to 280E. So I just want to give that caveat and uh, let you guys know about that. Uh, I think that's all we have on the uh, on the tax and financial end of things. Uh, Rachel, you want to take it away? Yep. Thank you. And I just wanted to um, point out that we have the upcoming webinars in our series on March 18th, April 22nd, and May 13th, all from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, invitations will be coming out shortly, so please keep an eye out for those. And then we can launch questions. So I think that there were some questions that had come in earlier um, about um, there was one question I think we had gotten about just like typical construction details for, for cannabis facilities, um, which, you know, I know in our experience, at least in our firm with clients that have had medical facilities, it really is just a location based issue. Um, and real estate is a really big component of what we've seen in, in the medical rounds and what we expect to see um, in, the, uh, in the adult use rounds as well. Um, so, you know, what I would say with respect to that question in particular, just about real estate in general and, and about uh, how a facility should be structured, a lot of it has to do with operational details and, and functionally location, um, but we'd be happy to talk offline about that issue with anybody who has that question. I'm just going to piggyback off Arash of for those of you who are looking to, to get into construction for facilities. Just be mindful of the labor obligations under the new law. There are PLAs that are a requirement. There are other labor components that are required. Um, so you should be factoring that into your cost as well. So it looks like Tom and Ryan, we just got a question about what are some of the top strategies to reduce the impact of 280E? Yeah, I think I could, I could take that one since I that is my specialty. But um, yeah, so some some of the big mitigating factors are that you need to really, like I said, cost of goods sold is the only thing that these cannabis companies are taking. So you need to have a good tracking system, a good inventory tracking system where you can track seed to sale. Um, you need to know what you have on inventory at all, all, all times, whether you're cultivating, manufacturing, processing, uh, or, or you own a dispensary. Inventory is key. Uh, documentation is absolutely everything. You know, they're going to come in and say, you know what, that's not cost of goods sold. We're going to pull that out. You need to document everything. You know, it is a cash business. You need to keep good records. You need to have a good administrative administrative staff on hand. Um, also, I don't want to give away the kitchen sink, but I, I I see a lot of capital expenditures, all the depreciation, amortization, going through 280E and being disallowed. But it, it doesn't have to be that way, right? Like if you have if you have grow lights, if you like I said, you have fans, refrigeration, you know that's all part of cost of goods sold. That's all part of creating that plant and growing that plant. So you can move that depreciation above the line and take a deduction for it. Uh, it doesn't have to be disallowed. And then I always advise that you have a good team, whether it be tax advisors, a legal team, or just a network of cannabis business owners that you want to bounce stuff off of. It's always good to have you know that team if you're if you're not sure in this business. Um, and I went into tax structuring before. Just be careful how you structure the business. Always good to get that team on board in the infancy stage of your business, not when you're already established, right? We don't want to go backwards when we come in. 
we want to we want to set you up correctly and have that path going forward in the right direction. So that's that that's my uh, that's my input. Right. And I see someone asked a question about uh, the problems that are faced in in, in starting the business, starting the, during the application process. Um, God, that that's that's so varied. Uh, I mean, you've got to be careful of who you're taking on potentially as as partners. Uh, I think it would be you know it'd behoove you to run background checks on individuals and make sure that they don't have criminal backgrounds. Uh, so from a financing perspective, you've got to be careful of that. Um, you've got to you know talk to the locality or the municipality that you're you're with to see what properties uh, can be developed, what can't. I believe with the application too, they're also looking for drawings of what the what the entity is going to look like. Um, so you're going to have to hire someone or likely have to hire someone to assist you with that. Um, there, and as I mentioned earlier, you, you're going to need to give careful consideration to making sure that any data, personal data that you get is secure. Uh, you're going to have to be paying employees, so you're going to have information, you know, social security numbers, things of that nature. You're going to need that. Um, you know, what else? I mean, just having having the processes in place to uh, ensure the the board that you're serious about what it is you're doing and that um, you have the financial wherewithal essentially to get to get the business off the ground. So. It really does run the gamut. There's a number of different uh, angles that need to be carefully looked at. Yeah, and, and really, at the end of the day, those that have been successful in the medical rounds are people that had everything covered, right? So, you know, we've seen clients who had capital issues because the cost of carrying real estate during the application period was significant. Um, and then others who just, you know, didn't have the right mixture of partners or, or were debarred just for really, really small issues. So, um, you know, in terms of what to have ready, I think it really is everything. Um, and I know, I think that we all feel at least that having everything ready for the adult use rounds is going to be very, very important. And, and also, Raj, too, you know, it's interesting. The, the process is one thing, but, you know, folks do need to be very careful if they are taking on partners that they're setting up something. There's some sort of buy-sell agreement you know what's going to happen in the event that uh, an individual partner wants out. You know, anything along those lines that just uh, reduces the chance of there being some sort of drawn out litigation later on, uh, that's something folks need to give consideration to as well. 100%. And for those of you that have been asking questions, there's been a, a bunch of questions about 280E um, and some of these other larger issues. You know, as I as I said from the start here, this is this seminar was meant to really just be an introduction, um, and we plan on doing additional ones um, every few weeks or every month that will really focus in on some of these issues, in particular 280E being one of them, the real estate issues, um, in addition to the fact that you know there's a whole new slew of employment law issues um, for just regular employers uh, due to this this uh, new marketplace existing within the state. Looks like that's it, right? I think that's I think all so. I have. Yep. Yeah, I believe so. So, you know, I think pleasure having all of you aboard. Um, and again, thanks to, to Jen and Tom and Ryan um, and our teams at Lithium and Jennifer Burns. And have other questions that came out of this seminar. I know we'd all be happy to uh, answer emails for you. Um, I know that that the Witham team and the Jennifer Burns teams are much broader than just the four of us that are here today. Um, and contain people with a lot of a lot of different areas of expertise that are really important to um, anybody who wants to be successful in this marketplace in this region. And Raj, Jennifer, thank you very much for being a part of this today. Thanks for taking time out of your days. We we appreciate it. And uh, I think that wraps it up for today, folks. So we'll see you. When is our next? What's our next date? I'm sorry, I should know that. March 18th. Invite March 18th. All right, perfect. So hopefully you'll join us on March 18th. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.